You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's September 30th. Recent events, such as nationwide protests against racism and continued attempts to delegitimize the 2020 presidential election, have put a spotlight on the role that public schools play in preparing youth to engage in civic life. A RAND survey conducted late last year examines one important question related to this issue. How do America's teachers approach civic and citizenship education? Here's just a sample of the findings. The survey responses suggest that civic and citizenship education in U.S. classrooms is often siloed into specific subjects, such as social science. Only a quarter of teachers reported that civics is integrated into all subjects or is a part of the whole school experience. Elementary teachers were more likely than secondary teachers to say that civic and citizenship education is integrated into all subjects. And when we ask teachers to identify the most important aims of civic and citizenship education, these three came out on top. First, promoting critical and independent thinking. Second, developing conflict resolution skills. And third, promoting students' knowledge of citizens' rights and responsibilities. Why is it important to understand how civic and citizenship education is being provided in public schools? Well, it could help lay the groundwork for broader understanding of how this instruction helps kids navigate the world. And that might make a difference in confronting some of the biggest challenges facing society, including truth decay, the declining role of facts in American public life. Russia regularly uses limited military actions toward the U.S. and its allies. These behaviors fall short of direct aggression, but they create escalatory risks. For a recent specific example, we can look to the Arctic Ocean, where Russian nuclear-powered submarines carried out military exercises north of the Bering Strait, which separates the eastern part of Russia and Alaska. Newly published RAND research takes a comprehensive look at these coercive behaviors over recent years. In fact, it's the first comprehensive study of the drivers of Russian coercive signaling. It's important to note that this research was conducted before Moscow's large-scale invasion of Ukraine in February. And again, the focus is on Russians signaling toward the U.S. and its treaty allies, not Ukraine. Still, with U.S.-Russia tensions rising in light of the war in Ukraine, the report is very timely. Overall, the authors conclude that much of the assertive, dangerous, or unsafe activities that Russia engages in are responsive rather than proactive. In other words, Moscow appears to be using coercive signals to send messages to the U.S. and its NATO allies about activities that it finds problematic. As tensions between Russia and the West peak, the findings in this new report may help decision-makers better understand what drives the Kremlin's behavior and establish guidelines for assessing it in the future. Billionaire Elon Musk and Twitter are in the midst of a legal battle over Musk's bid to buy the social media company. The issue of bot accounts has been front and center, as Musk has cited the number of bots on Twitter as a primary reason for backing out of the deal. According to Rand's Mark Posard, Musk may have a point about bots, and Twitter isn't the only social media giant facing this problem. Back in 2017, Facebook claimed that ads on its platforms could reach 41 million Americans between the ages of 18 and 24. However, the U.S. Census Bureau claimed that only 31 million Americans in this age group existed. Posard says that companies like Twitter and Facebook may simply not want to look too closely at this issue. If they did, then they would have to remove accounts that are bots, trolls, or otherwise inauthentic, reducing the number of reported active users on the platform and almost certainly affecting advertising revenues. But transparency around who is actually a real person on social media is important. Third-party auditors and independent researchers could provide estimates of active users, 
That is, of course, if they had access to social media platform data and the freedom to publish. These estimates would help ensure that investors, advertisers, and policymakers can make informed decisions. China is not an Arctic country. However, it has become a notable player in the region by engaging in economic, scientific, cultural, diplomatic, and military activities in and around various Arctic nations. In a new report, Rand researchers examine Beijing's activities and ambitions in the Arctic. And consider the potential risks that could develop in a region whose physical, political, economic, and social characteristics set it apart from the rest of the world. Overall, the report's main finding is good news for Washington. The authors conclude that Chinese investments and presence in the North American Arctic remain fairly limited. This is not for lack of trying on Beijing's part. Rather, U.S., Danish, and Canadian efforts to block and restrict China in key industries, including rare earth elements, petroleum, and submarine telecommunications cables, have been successful. The report does point out that not all factors that have prevented Chinese inroads in the Arctic are within U.S. control, and of course, conditions could change over time. For these reasons, Washington should maintain and strengthen solidarity among its allies and partners, and work more closely with indigenous populations in the Arctic. In the U.S., policing outcomes and residents' views on policing differ greatly from neighborhood to neighborhood, and these differences are often associated with race and ethnicity. As an example. Data has shown that police spend considerably more time in neighborhoods with predominantly Hispanic, Asian, and in particular, Black residents. Additionally, a recent Rand study looked at nearly a decade's worth of police stops in Virginia. It found that when a Black motorist was pulled over for speeding in a particular range, they were about forty percent more likely to be cited for misdemeanor criminal charges. Than a white motorist pulled over for the same behavior, according to Rand's Alicia John, these disparities suggest that a one-size-fits-all approach to police reform is likely to fail. Instead, solutions should focus on community engagement, working with community members to identify reforms specific to their needs. In one community, this might mean having more black officers in supervisory roles within police departments to better represent the community. In another, where residents are fearful of the police, it might mean reducing the size of the force. But in yet another neighborhood, where, say, residents feel comforted by the police, reform might mean maintaining or even bolstering the police presence. Whatever the exact solution. The key is for community engagement to be a central part of every discussion surrounding police reform. With this approach, everyone in every neighborhood stands to benefit. John says because it results in police interventions that are more effective and sustainable. Quote: Ultimately, the community, in collaboration with local public officials, should determine what it means to serve and protect. Rand is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on today's episode, check the show notes at rand.org/podcast. We're off next week, but we'll be back with you on October 14th. See you then.